Hi everyone, Ted Wyman here with another edition of On the Rocks where we talk about Canadian curling and today I am joined by a curling legend. I don't know if you like that term because you're still a pretty young guy, but curling legend Mark Kennedy, uh, been to the Olympics numerous times, has won a gold medal, has won everything there is in curling, played all over the place and is with a new team this year. And Mark, welcome to On the Rocks. Great to see you. How are you? Hey, Ted, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, legend. Uh, that just makes me sound old. But uh, but yeah, no, uh, curling's obviously been uh, great to me and looking forward to uh, talking to you. And thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, you know, I mean, you've obviously played with some great teams over the years. Uh, Kevin Martin comes to mind. Kevin Cooey comes to mind. These are some of the all-time greats of this game. And now you're with a new team with Brendan Botcher. And you've also got Brett Gallant and uh, Ben Hebert, who are legends in their own right, you know, uh, in this game. Tell me about the dynamic of the new team. Yeah, it's uh, it's been great, actually. Um, you know, I've been really lucky to play with some great players. So, you know, when you when you see great players, um, you know, these are these are good ones. Um, you know, Brett and ha having a chance to play with Benny again is great. Uh, but Brett and, and Brendan are just, they're wise beyond their years. You know, sometimes I have to ask them again what their age is to be in their early thirties and to have that much success and that much knowledge about the game. You know, Benny and I have joked about how much we're learning from the young guys more so than they're probably learning from us. So, uh, it's been a terrific dynamic, easy guys to get along with. Um, and we're really just starting to build that foundation and structure of a new team. You know, what, what the practices look like, what the communication is like. Um, and so far, so good. You know, we've, we really enjoyed each other and I, we think we've got something special here, but um, now we're going to have to put in the work to, to match what those best teams in the world are doing. Um, but we've gotten off to a good start and we're looking forward to, to seeing if we can reach our potential. I just wanted to uh, move on with something about you just said, which is trying to match what's going on in the rest of the world. Now, I know you were, part of the Olympics last year uh, with the mixed doubles team and, uh, and, and a fifth player with the uh, Gushu team. Um, what did you see in terms of, uh, and you've been to the Olympics before you were there in 2018. Um, what are you seeing in terms of what these international teams are doing that you feel like the Canadian teams have to match? Hey, they're, they're putting more into certain areas of the game and they've surpassed us. Um, you know, the work ethic of some of the international teams where they approach it like a professional sport and they've got their, you know, curling laboratories that they call them and, and they get out there on the ice and they, they look at all ins and outs of their games, their releases, their sweeping, their strategy, they're doing, uh, you know, they're looking at video, um, they're doing everything they can to improve and, and raise the bar and uh, that's something I don't think Canadian teams are really embracing. You know, a lot of, and this includes myself over the past few years, we're kind of thinking that we're going to win on skill and talent and a little bit of practice. And that's just not cutting it anymore. Um, and, you know, going back to forming our new team, part of our focus was to make sure that all four of us were in the same province. So that idea of centralization where we can get together now and, and put in that extra bit of work, um, in regards to all those areas, strategy, sweeping, releases, uh, weight control. Like, let's actually put the time in if we're going to match these professional teams. Because the growth in some of those countries and how far they've come in the last decade has been incredible. Um, so we've got to put the work in to, to match their, their level of work. Do you feel like uh, other teams have taken that same philosophy as you are? Because you and I talked about this last spring, and it certainly sounded interesting to me because obviously you were saying we need to do something that's going to improve our chances of being the best team in the world and not just focusing on Canada, focusing on being the best team in the world. Do you think other teams are seeing that and doing that as well? And, and as a second part to that, I mean, a lot of us have talked about the need for Curling Canada to do something to try to help you guys do this. Is this sort of a case of you guys taking it into your own hands? I. Uh... Yes. Yeah, I, I think you nailed it. Um, I, I do think, you know, back to your first question, I do think teams are seeing that, you know, it's no surprise. Canadian curlers are aware of what's happening internationally, whether they're doing it or not. You know, some probably are, some maybe not so much. Um, but all you got to do is look at Team Gushu over the past four years. Um, it's no secret that they 
of why they won so much. You know, that team was together a lot and they practiced a lot and they worked hard together. You know, I got to see it in the lead up to the Olympics, how hard they practiced, the intensity and, and the time that they put in on the ice. Um, it was more than I had seen from many teams in a long time. So, you know, no, no surprise. They ended up having a dominant couple of years. Um, so, you know, and, and Curling Canada has been trying to get teams to to do this, encourage teams to spend more time together, have training weekends, you know, but we did, we decided as a group that we don't need somebody to tell us what to do. We need to start doing this ourselves, you know, and part of that is uh, bringing on Paul Webster as a coach. Paul Webster was a great asset to Curling Canada for a long time. Uh, and he's kind of our central figure for making sure that we're putting in the time and effort and, and making sure that we're accountable to one another uh, and not relying on Curling Canada to tell us what to do or when to do it. You know, we're doing it because we want to do it and we want to, to push the limits of what we can do and, and see if we can get up there with those uh, Adines and Moets and Gushus of the world. Well, it's just interesting because I wasn't in, actually intending to continue on with this, but it is interesting because, you know, there's so many good teams in Canada. It makes it hard for the national body to identify one or two and say, we're going to take you and put you into a uh, laboratory like you talk about with the European teams it's a little easier in Scotland to do that or in Great Britain it's a little easier in Sweden to do that and we've seen the results with Nicholas Adin and Bruce Mallet and and teams like that from some other countries um, so it, there is a case here where th there is kind of an onus on the curlers to try to do it yourselves because if you don't there's not going to be that opportunity yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And on that note, too, you know, Curling Canada does have to adapt their model to what's going on in the curling world. There's been lots of discussion and, uh, and ideas thrown around as to what they should do. You know, we've had a system where we've had so much depth of talent throughout the country that, you know, Curling Canada um, kind of puts their resources into a whole wide breadth of curling teams and, and athletes across the country. Maybe it is time for them to start focusing on on a, you know, maybe more resources to less teams, you know, the ones that are going to be approaching the game a little bit more from a professional standpoint, you know, that's some of the discussions that we've had as well. Um, and pumping lots of resources and, and money and effort into the young up and coming curlers. You know, you want to see the guys like Tyler Tardy or, um, you know, the Matt Dunstones of the world and, and these young athletes, you want them to have the opportunity to, to make curling their professional life. Um, so we'll see lots of discussions going on and lots of changes and we'll see what happens over the next few years. But but metal results are obviously a very important part of Curling Canada's business model. Um, so doing as much as they can to make sure that those top teams are prepared and able to put in the time and effort to match what those international teams are doing. It's going to be very important. Seems like a massive undertaking, really, and something that's not going to happen overnight. My understanding is conversations have started, surveys. Uh, consultation firms, that kind of thing. Um, and there have been some changes and I just segue into the fact that you just came out of the points bet invitation allowed in Fredericton, which was a whole new style of uh, curling event. And um, I guess I just wanted to hear your perspective on, on what you thought of that. And if you think that's a step in the right direction in terms of just changing things up and doing things a little differently in this country. Uh, I, I do, I loved it. I thought it was great. Uh, you know, maybe not for the same reasons that a lot of other people would think, but I loved the intensity of an arena style event this early in the year. You know, we often don't get that environment until, you know, maybe the first slam in October or, um, you know, sometimes even later than that. So to step on arena ice and have a, you know, a do or die game really got the juices flowing early in the year and, and kind of gave you an idea of, okay, this is, these are the things we need to work on as a group. Cause sometimes you don't know that until you get into those bigger moments and they felt like big moments. Uh, so that's good from a competitive perspective for a lot of those top teams. I think they really enjoyed that. Um, I love uh, points bets involvement in curling and, and you know, their, uh, their corporate group was out there and they seem to love it as well, which is great for curling. Um, you know, getting, uh, getting your TV viewers invested in a, in a game early in September, I think is great as well. So lots of really positive stuff. And I, I hope they continue that over the next few years. Um, so yeah, not, nothing really negative to say about it. And, and I know you're probably going to segue into the, the whole extra end debate as well, aren't you? 
Uh, how did you know? I mean, uh, ESP <laughs> as well as being a great curler. Um, so yes, uh, I did talk to some other curlers, you know, Jen Jones, who won the women's side said she absolutely hated it. Um, Reed Carruthers was a little more, he won the men's side. He was a little more open to the idea of trying new things. Now we know that the world curling federation has discussed actually making this an official change in the rules of curling, which would be that um, they would throw an, a draw in an extra end as opposed to playing extra ends. Sorry. Uh, you know, you, there would be no extra end, just a draw. This is what you guys did at the points bet invitational and i i'm just curious to hear your take on whether what you thought of it as a test and if you see this coming down the road so i do see it coming down the road i think um trying to eliminate extra ends has been something that's been on the table for a while um if they are going to go in this direction with the draw to the button i certainly hope that they would change the the point system similar to what you would see in the NHL. So, you know, three points for an all-out victory, two points for a draw to the button victory, one point for a draw to the button loss, you know, that type of model um, so that the entire game isn't, you know, based on a, a draw to the button at the very end of the game. So that's, I think that's hopefully the direction that they go. Uh, personally, I, I wish, I wish they wouldn't touch extra ends. I think it's in a very important part of the game. It's a very important part of strategy as you get towards the end of the game. You, you know, you you want to be a team that has the hammer going to the extra end and you call the game accordingly. So it'll it'll change the game. Um, and you know what? We've tinkered so much with our sport in the last decade. I would love to just see it settle for a while. You know, let's just let it rest. And every, every year we seem to be making all these big changes to to accommodate the fans and to accommodate the television. And sometimes I wonder what's, what's actually wrong with our game. Um, you know, and maybe you can touch on this more than me. I, I stay out a lot of these conversations, but is eliminating the extra end due to the time constraints on television, or is it due to the fact that the team with the hammer wins most of the games? Well, it could be a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B Mark, but I did talk to an executive at the Olympics in Beijing who told me, TV, 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 like that's yeah. where this is all the most important thing. Now, you and I both know that when Nicholas Adin has the hammer in an extra end, he wins something like 90% of the time. So does Brad Gushu, I'm sure your team as well, you know, because you guys know how to play the end. The tick rule, the no tick rule will help a bit with that. But, but you know, um, they want to get this into time slots that they can use so that curling is more marketable around the world. And that's the number one thing that's the most important here. But it really changes the purity of the game in a lot of ways, doesn't it? And yeah. you know, the it actual does. strategy in the ninth and tenth end is completely different. Uh, Reed Carruthers was saying you might want to give up a steal, uh, you know, in the ninth, and come home with a hammer yeah. rather than going to the extra end and taking your chance. Yeah, you you nailed it. Yeah, the strategy definitely changes. And if we're worried about time slots, you know, we we play an entire tour season with eight ends. And, and as athletes, we've gotten used to it and we love it. So why all of a sudden, why is that not a change that's being considered in championship curling? If you're worried about time slots, just drop it to eight ends. You know, instead of doing something like eliminating extra ends, which entirely changes, to your point, the purity of the game. Um, so, you know, as an athlete, sometimes I feel like we, a lot of those things are out of our control. A lot of those decisions are being made by the powers that be that, Often we don't even know who they are. They just come down the pipeline to us and, hey, this is what you're doing this year. Uh, it, I find that really unfortunate that the athletes don't have more of, of a say in, in their own sport. Um, yeah, and I think curling is kind of falling victims sometimes to making all these changes to bring in more fans and accommodate the TV. But at the end of the day, sometimes it just confuses fans. You know, I've got... Uh, I've got a 68 year old mom who loves watching curling, but every week comes to me and says, what's with this rule change and what are the rules this week and why are we doing this? And, you know, you're, you're alienating some of your long-term traditional fans as well. So I think they need to be really careful, you know, and back to your original question, I didn't really like the draw to the button. It almost made it a foregone conclusion that whatever team got to pick the side was going to win the draw to the button by a landslide. You know, when you had uh, Brad Gushu, who's, in my opinion, the best draw guy in the world, uh, not sure what weight to throw on his draw to the button, you know, that's eliminating a huge part of the skill of the game. 
I'd rather have seen Reed have to draw the forefoot in the extra end to win. Um, but you know, so didn't love it, but, uh, definitely willing to try some new things and, and, um, we'll see if it sticks or not. Well, you know, you hit on the biggest mystery to me in all of, uh, in all of this, in terms of the World Curling Federation's vision for the future, and that's why they're so resistant to going to eight ends. You guys have been using it in the slams forever. Works well with those TV time slots. It's been talked about that maybe this quadrennial that it would be adopted by the World Curling Federation, Curling Canada, and so on and so forth. And yet there seems to be no interest in doing that. And yet going to something so much more radical that literally changes the game. You know, how much, how is 10 ends so much more pure than actually giving up an extra end that I don't understand. So um, yeah, I don't know. And, and to touch on your point really quickly too, I think over the years, you know, the grand slams have been a wonderful place to try new things. And over the years they've tried so many new things. I couldn't even list them um, and different styles of play, you know, and the, the five rock rule started at the slams, the no tick rule started at the slams, um, you know, different versions of how to play. It's a great place to try new things there seems to be a resistance to use those things at championship events. And I don't really know why that exists, but you know, not uh, like I've mentioned before, if I think about it too much, I just end up getting frustrated. So it's, it's very much out of my control and we just kind of have to work with the rules that are given to us. Well, I don't want to speak too much for someone else, but Brad Gushu has told me numerous times that he supports the idea of having the 10 ends in the championship events, right? It's like a major in golf. You're going to, you're doing something different or a major in tennis where you go to five sets instead of three. And, you know, I guess that makes some sense, but if you're really looking at this extra end thing, I think it doesn't make sense. It would be a far better fix for the game, in my opinion, to go to eight ends. And it sounds like you would agree with that, but I just, I wanted to touch on one other thing, uh, Mark, and that was, uh, you know, something very somber that happened while you guys were out at the points bet invitational and that was the sudden death of uh new brunswick curler jamie brannon and i know from talking to some other people that it you know was uh sent major shockwaves through the whole uh event and through the whole curling community in new brunswick i'm sure you knew jamie uh can you just give me a thought on on what happened there yeah devastating you know and the fact that we were in new brunswick when it happened i i received a message from uh jamie watson who's the the manager at the capital winter club she said did you hear the news I was in a little bit of shock. I think everybody was, you know, young guy, 47 years old, great. Uh, he was in great shape, great curler. So, you know, that type of stuff sends shockwaves throughout the curling community. Um, had a chance to play against him a lot at the Briars over the years. You know, pretty uh, quiet guy, um, but great teammate, great curler. And um, yeah, my condolences to him and his young family and, Hey, Ted, just enjoy every day you got because you never know what's going to happen. And, um, you know, I hope uh, I hope his family, um, you know, heals from it and, um, you know, devastating news about his dad as well, you know, passing away on the same day. So just awful news for the curling community and um, awful for James Gratton and his guys who I know were really close with Jamie. And yeah, just just devastating to lose such a such a wonderful guy and a wonderful, wonderful teammate and great curler. Well, thank you for that, Mark, and thank you very much for all of this. Uh, it's been great talking to you. Your perspective on curling is right up there with your resume as a player. Uh, I appreciate it very much, and uh, all the best with the season. I guess it's a while, uh, a bit now, until the next big event, but uh, like you said, it was kind of good to get it off to a, a rock and start with that uh, early event in September. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ted. Really appreciate it. Good luck with the On the Rocks show, and thanks for having me on. All right, for Mark Kennedy, I'm Ted Wyman. You've been watching On the Rocks.